students. Professor Jared Rathel here. I welcome you to the fourth lecture in our second unit. So today we're going to be focused on what Charles Darwin called the mystery of mysteries. That is the origin of new species. So where do new species come from? How do new species actually emerge? At the onset, I want to stress to you that evolution is a difficult concept for the human brain to comprehend. First, evolution operates over millennia, right? These vast stretches of deep time and oftentimes broad geographic regions. Human beings, we live for maybe 80 years if we're lucky. Secondly, the human brain, our minds, are sculpted to force nature into discrete categories, right? It's, it's lions and tigers. But evolution is a continuous process across both time and space as ancestral gene pools split Sometimes they collide again, and then they separate again. So at first, it's probably not apparent to you, but what you're witnessing here is the evolution of a new salamander species. You're witnessing the process of speciation. So these are all the same species of salamander. The ancestral stock uh, Picta here lives in Northern California. So this subspecies, Picta, is highly variable, both morphologically and genetically. So Picta's gene pool flows down here until it hits the Central Valley of California. The Central Valley, it's inhospitable habitat for salamanders. They can't live here. So this gene pool collides with the Central Valley, and some salamanders live up here in the Sierra Nevada Mountains, Platensis, whereas other salamanders live here along the coast, Xanthoticta. And what you can see is this species is beginning to diverge. There's this reproductive barrier here, the Central Valley, which prevents intermixing of genes between Platensis and Xanthoticta. Platensis here, you can see, is um, showing some camouflage, right? It's got this dark and light uh, spotting, splotching, right? So it can blend in in the forest uh, in pine needles with dappled sunshine. Whereas these guys down here, Xanthoticta, this one is mimicking a highly poisonous newt species that lives along the coast. So when this ring species comes back together here, these two subspecies, their ranges overlap in certain places. They exist in the same space, and they do occasionally interbreed. However, when they do interbreed, they produce this hybrid, Cloburi, down here on the bottom. Cloburi is weak and frail. It often doesn't survive to adulthood. So what you're seeing, this reproductive isolation that's caused by the Central Valley, is separating the gene pools. It's the driver of speciation. Reproductive isolation is what forms new species. Some key definitions to start. Microevolution. Micro, of course, means small. This refers to changing allele frequencies over time and across space. So it's small changes in allele frequencies from one generation to the next. Recall an allele is an alternate version of a gene. So consider these muscles here. The allele LAP94 
the uh, is represented by purple and this slice of pie represents the proportion of lap 94 in the population of muscles so lap 94 is an allele that helps muscles osmoregulate it helps them balance the amount of water and salts in their system it helps them cope with increasing salinity as we would predict uh, muscles found in this population, population number one, this is brackish water. It's got a lot of freshwater inputs, right? So they have a much smaller proportion of lap 94 alleles across this population. However, as we move out Long Island Sound and out to the open ocean sites at 10 and 11, we see the proportion of this allele, lap 94, dramatically increase. There's selection for it as we move to this highly salty water. So, we'll come back to microevolution, changing allele frequencies across both space as well as time in the next two lectures when we talk about the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation as well as the evolution of populations. In contrast to microevolution, macroevolution represents big, broad patterns in lineages above the species level. These are the types of patterns that we see in the fossil record. For example, these guys, known as the terror birds, are far more kick-ass than dinosaurs, and nobody hardly, nobody knows about them. So the terror birds consist of at least 18 flightless carnivorous species that ranged in size from 3 feet to, get this, 10 feet tall. These were the apex predators of South America, the 10-foot uh, species hunting deer-sized prey, running them down and ripping them up with powerful beaks. These were the apex predators in South America up until just 1.8 million years ago. So they were on life stage much more recently than dinosaurs. So... We'll talk about this in just a few slides in this lecture, but when Panama, the Isthmus of Panama, emerges from the ocean about 2.7 million years ago, it connects North America and South America, and large carnivorous canines, felines, and bears move from North America into South America in what is known as the Great American Interchange. These new large-bodied predators in South America outcompeted the terror birds and they went extinct. So these patterns, broad patterns above the species level in the fossil record is what we call macroevolution. So how do we complete this puzzle? How do we connect microevolution, small changes in allele frequencies from one generation to the next, to macroevolution, big, broad patterns that we see in the fossil record over millions of years? And the answer is our focus today, speciation. The formation of new species connects micro with macro evolution. Before we can discuss speciation, we first have to define what is meant by a biological species. These, what appear to be Colombian spotted frogs, are spurred on by environmental cues and are having, for lack of better words, an orgy. So it's this explosion of mating in these frogs when the timing is right. These individuals are all considered the same species because A, they have the potential to interbreed in nature, and B, they produce viable, that means living, fertile 
offspring. This is what we call the biological species concept. Now, admittedly, this is an old concept, and it's a bit of a clunky one. As I'll demonstrate in just a minute, this is the best we've got at forcing the continuous evolutionary process of speciation into discrete categories that we call species. Consider these two birds, the western meadowlark on the left and the eastern meadowlark on the right. So glaciation events in North America repeatedly split their ancestral gene pool, causing speciation. Today, their ranges actually overlap in a number of states in the Midwest and in New Mexico, but they don't interbreed. Why? I admittedly have zero musical ability, but even to my untrained ear, those songs sound dramatically different. What is one of the main reasons why birds sing? I mean, it sounds like a horribly maladaptive idea to announce to all the neighborhood cats your location. Male birds sing to attract mates. Females choose their mates based on the quality of the male's songs. In places where the western and eastern meadowlark live in the same area, in places where their ranges overlap, a male western meadowlark song sounds terrible to an eastern female, and vice versa. So hence, these two distinct lineages are maintained. They no longer swap genes, and based on our biological species concept, individuals that do not interbreed in nature are considered separate species. What about these two organisms? Are they the same or different species? On the left, you have the horse, Equus ferris, and on your right, the adorable donkey or ass, Equus asinus. So a male donkey is actually quite capable of interbreeding with a female horse producing the lovable mule. <laughs> so if you've ever taken a pack trip in the mountains, you don't really want a horse because they can be kind of skittish on those steep trails. And you don't really want a donkey because they're not really big enough to carry very much. What you want is a mule, sure-footed and large-bodied. So horses and donkeys are capable of interbreeding and producing these hybrids, this mule. Does that mean that they're the same species? Nope. So mules are sterile hybrids. They're incapable of successful reproduction. You can't breed mules. Horses have 64 chromosomes in the nucleus of their cells. Donkeys have 62, so that leaves the mule with an odd number, with 63 chromosomes, making meiosis an absolute train wreck. So the horse and the donkey are different species, according to the biological species concept. Although they interbreed in nature, they don't produce viable, fertile offspring. Okay, 
What about the polar bear on the left and the grizzly bear on the right? The same or different species? The growler or pizzly is a fertile hybrid that has now been observed to occur in both captivity and in the wild. The first documented instance of a growler in the wild occurred in 2006 when DNA testing revealed that a strange harvested bear had a polar bear mother and grizzly bear father. Since then, there have been at least seven confirmed wild hybrids. So these two lineages had historically been kept apart by ecological or habitat isolation. The polar bear evolved to hunt seals on the pack ice, and the grizzly bear is a generalist adapted for boreal forests. Yet, as the climate warms, grizzly bears are expanding their range northward, and hungry, desperate polar bears faced with sea ice that's forming later and later and breaking up earlier and earlier are now moving south, seeking other resources. So the gene pools of the polar and grizzly bears are colliding once again as genetic evidence suggests, has occurred multiple times over several million years. With polar and grizzly bears, the biological species concept really breaks down. As technically, I mean, if we're purists, according to the, the concept, the polar and the grizzly bear are now considered the same species. Similarly, a liger is a hybrid produced from a male lion and a female tiger, where a tigon is the reverse. So male ligers and tigons are sterile, but females are viable and fertile. So my point is, speciation is a continuous process as gene pools drift apart and then sometimes collide again. It's a process that happens over millennia. And some lineages that we think of as separate, like grizzly bears and polar bears, we think of them as discrete species, but actually they haven't accumulated enough genetic differences to be reproductively incompatible. Before we move on, I want you to meet Hercules. Hercules, Hercules! 922 pounds. This liger is the world's largest living cat, bigger than both tigers and lions. And one more, you really know you're a badass when you ride a liger to work. The big idea that I hope you walk away with today is that reproductive isolation, splitting, an ancestral gene pool into two is what causes speciation. It's what allows for the origin of new species. So this little spit of land, now known as the country of Panama, was formed about 2.7, 2.8 million years ago when sea levels dropped, water was locked up in the poles and glaciation. Sea levels drop, Panama emerges. So now you have this geographic barrier, right, that created the Pacific big claw shrimp here and the Caribbean big claw shrimp, snapping shrimp here. Then we have the Pacific uh, striped snapping shrimp and the Caribbean striped snapping shrimp. This geographic barrier has split their gene pools. They become re reproductively isolated and they've speciated. And it's not just the shrimp, right? We see the same phenomenon happening with the butterfly fish. There's a Pacific and a Caribbean butterfly fish. The echinoderms, the mollusks, 
a geographic barrier, Panama, now prevents gene flow, and new mutations and adaptations on both sides, right, are causing these different gene pools to drift apart. But I remind you here, though, it's not just physical barriers that can keep gene pools apart. There's a whole suite of mechanisms, like differing behaviors, different songs in our meadowlarks that can maintain reproductive isolation. To explore these mechanisms for reproductive isolation, first let us consider the zygote. Recall that when two haploid gametes fuse, the sperm and the egg come together, it creates a diploid cell. We call this a zygote. Mechanisms of reproductive isolation that prevent the formation of the zygote are known as prezygotic reproductive barriers. Consider the meadowlarks singing different songs. This behavior prevents the formation of any hybrid zygotes. Behavioral um, barriers are prezygotic. Reproductive barriers that occur after zygote formation that prevent the hybrid from becoming viable or fertile uh, are what we call post-zygotic barriers. So that lovable mule is viable, it lives, but it's sterile. So uh, hi sterilized hybrids are a post-zygotic barrier. So on your weekly assessment, you will be responsible for recognizing these seven mechanisms that maintain gene pool integrity, that maintain reproductive isolation. Temporal, ecological, or habitat, behavioral, mechanical, hybrid inviability, hybrid infertility, and hybrid breakdown. So you have an activity on Canvas where you will read seven, they're short, real world case studies, and you're gonna identify which species represents which mechanism for reproductive isolation. So, we now recognize that for a new species to emerge, two populations have to become reproductively isolated. Does that mean they have to be geographically isolated? Do they have to be separated by an isthmus? I can never say that word. A mountain? Um, a glacier? Not necessarily. Okay, last concept today. There are two types of speciation. Allopatric. Allo means other and patric means homeland. So allopatric speciation is speciation that is driven by a physical geographic barrier, like a drying lake that suddenly split into two lakes, now creating two separate cichlid species, like we see in the great African lakes. Sympatric speciation occurs in the absence of a geographic barrier. Here, there's some behavioral or genetic mechanism that separates the two populations that still coexist in the same area. The antelope squirrels are a wonderful example of allopatric speciation right here in Arizona. So on the south rim of the Grand Canyon, we find the Harris's antelope squirrel. It's on the south rim and it stretches all the way down to the Phoenix Valley. So you'll see these little guys, the Harris's antelope squirrel, scurrying around in the white tanks or the estrellas. On the north rim, which is really uh, not that far as the crow flies, on the north rim of the Grand Canyon, we find the white-tailed antelope squirrel. The Harris's antelope squirrel is absent. It's been replaced by this closely related species. So these are not flying squirrels. They can't glide. Thus, that 6,000-foot deep canyon is an insurmountable geographic barrier that has separated the gene pools 
of these now closely related species and maintains their reproductive isolation. The uh, antelope squirrels, a wonderful example of allopatric speciation. As a final and admittedly very gross example of sympatric speciation, these are two different species of lice that parasitize the human organism. The body louse on the top and the head louse on the bottom. So if you look closely, they have different morphologies in their front legs. The head louse is adapted for clinging to human hairs, while the body louse really specializes in grabbing hold of clothing and skin. So DNA evidence suggests that the body louse diverged from the head louse. The body louse evolved from the head louse about 190,000 years ago indicating that humans began fashioning and wearing clothes around that time, providing habitat for the body louse. So um, 200,000, 220,000 years is about the time that we become anatomically modern humans. Our cranial capacity reaches its current dimensions, and it's about the same time we started wearing clothes based on um, the molecular evidence examining differences between these two uh, species of lice. So these lice species diverged uh, sympatrically. They both inhabited the same space, the human organism, um, but they just diverged into different niches in that space. So with that, I encourage you to not hesitate to ask questions or post comments on the discussion board prior to your weekly assessment, and I really hope you enjoy the lecture. Thanks for your time.